Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this webinar on China's fuels market in the low carbon era. Brought to you by my steel, Global, and Annoyed in association with Dalian Commodities Exchange. I'm Crystal Yeo, Sales Directors of Annoyed, and today we have here with us Ben Johnstone and Li Hongmei from my steel. Chao Yunzhi from Dalian Commodities Exchange. They will give you a presentation about their respective companies and also about the current state of the steel sectors, projections for the long term, including demand, supply, hedging, and investment prospects. We will then end off the webinar with a panel discussion. Together with our speakers, they will be joined by panel guests Virgil Chai from Anuit and Sean Xie from My Steel Global. We had the opportunity. Um, you will have the opportunity to submit text questions by typing your questions into the questions control panels on your right. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentations, and then collect this, address them during the Q&A sessions. If you're running out of time, you can be rest assured that we have the answers sent back to you via the emails. Without further ado, I'm going to kick start today's webinar by giving you a brief introduction to Anuit. Anuit is the leading provider of commodities risk management solutions. We serve the energy and commodities companies globally. This is a quick sharing on Anwit's journey. Anwit has been providing easy time solutions for the commodities firms for over 12 years. We are a privately held company founded in the year 2008 in Houston, Texas by two of our founders, Dave Mayers and Ken Han. Together, we have almost about 50 years of experience in the easy time space. So being a business and technical architect themselves, they designed and built entry from the scratch. And this makes Anuit unique and differentiate us from the others is that our founders are both experts in the fields and we've then been hands-on on our project implementation, our system development, our update progress are timely and seamless. So with the HQ being set up, Anuit start to expand and win projects in the natural gas and coal sectors in the US in 2012. So in 2015, we started our Beijing office to support the growth of the China market. In 2016, we signed deals with major NOCs such as CNOC, Sinochem. In 2017, we opened up our Singapore office and started securing large trading firms as our clients, such as Kagyu, Mitsui, Mitsubishi. In 2018, it's the birth of our London office, followed by expanding into Tokyo and Shanghai in 2019. Some good news to share. Android has been awarded as a winner of a CTRM Software House of the Year by Risk.net in December 2020. This award celebrates various technological achievements that are improving the commodities risk management space, where Android leads in product features and product visions. We are very proud to receive this prestige award. Every two years, Commodities Technology Advisory conducts a vendor perception studies where industry players in the commodity space get to vote and rate for ECTRM providers. In 2020, Anuit is pleased to be named in the top position in the category as seen on the screen, um, taking the latest stock in energy such as the oil products, natural gas, metals, power, commodities management, technical architecture, and we also name as the overall market leaders in Asia. Entrade is truly a multi-commodity solutions for not only energy space, but also venture into commodities like metals and also into power to coal. And there's only one sequence database that share common components throughout the systems. So for example, all the commodities that you trade use the same accounting and risk systems. So in a nutshell, Entrade is a single platform to manage our clients' multi-commodities trading activities. Here it's a full schematic view from the beginning to the end. Entry itself will be the hub handling all the front mid back office operations for your commodities risk management, your trading, your scheduling, and even invoicing. Entry is designed to help you make better business decisions and also help to meet the requirements of matters, matters concentrates trading businesses. We offer a modern ECTRM systems with a very low total cost of ownership. So Enrich supports base metals, refined metals, ferrous metals, no ferrous metals, and many more. Here you can see that you know, Entrade solutions help to manage your front, mid, back office operations. So from your trade entry, to pricing, contract management, market data integration, 
logistic, bulk handling, blending, decision making, and reporting. Our solutions support all these functional trading and risk management requirements of wide variety of metals trading businesses. So recently, Entry has added to Pavilion Energy Spain in Bex, Japan, uh, My ID Indonesia into our client list, and we're expecting we work with more new clients in the coming month as well. This is a brief introduction of Entry. Below, please, please find my contacts. If you should have any queries or you should require a deep dive demonstrations, please let me know. So without further ado, I'm pleased to introduce Ben Johnston, Head of Sales from my steel to you. Ben, over to you. Hello everyone. So firstly, please allow me to introduce myself. My name is Ben Johnstone and I head up the sales department from MySteel Global. I'm personally located out of Melbourne in Australia and my role is that I oversee the subscriber base for our English related products, plus manage a small team of account managers based up in Shanghai. Here at MySteel, we have a wide range of service offerings. They range from our standard off the shelf subscription reports and databases, right through to an extensive range of industry conferences and events. Recently, we've also launched our research and consulting arm of the business, which is already proving to be popular amongst our clientele. If I can take a moment to talk about our core off-the-shelf packages. We have over a dozen different options available, but I'd like to focus on the three main ones. The first is that of our mysteel.net platform. This service is provided via a web portal, it includes access to pricing data, news, and other key indicators across all market sectors, steel, iron ore, base metals, ferro alloys, and more. It's really just your one-stop shop for all China metals and mining intelligence. It's important to recognize that in China, we have over 2000 staff conducting industry surveys, significantly more than any of our competitors. The surveys are conducted on a daily, weekly, bi-weekly, and monthly basis with all data being aggregated to form a number of quantitative surveys, which are published in various reports that we offer. The depth of these surveys we believe is unrivaled, which then provides for a unique level of transparency on the Chinese iron and steel industry. In addition to our website portal, we have multiple reports available in an easy to read PDF format. Arguably, our most popular are both our steel and steel raw materials daily report. The Steel Daily covers both long and flat steel and is an extensive report where we look at pricing, inventories, capacity and production, and much more. The Steel Raw Materials report covers off on iron ore, coal, and scrap. Whether it be inventories, shipping data, or even domestic mine operations, it's all covered. Both of these reports are published daily, and they also come with an accompanying Excel file with historical data to analyze and manipulate at your convenience. Whilst these are two of our main PDF reports that we publish, we have other reports looking at stainless steel, base metals, ferro alloys, and more. Another area I'd like to focus on is that of our iron ore research. It's an area we're extremely proud of. In 2017 and 2018, MySteel was awarded Best Iron Ore Research House, and that award was won over many well-known industry peers. This is a clear message that our data is the highest quality and well-respected within the wider marketplace. Currently, we have in excess of 10 highly bespoke iron ore reports available, which look at various parts of the market, including shipments, trading, arrival data, and more. Arguably, our most important or popular subscription is that of our iron ore inventories report. This report will not only break down the data by port, but also by product. These are all high-end market intelligence, and I can confidently say that no competitor goes to the depth that we do on the Chinese iron ore market. Again, this should be evident by the various awards that we've won. Many of you, I'm sure, would have access to a Bloomberg terminal, but what many won't know is that behind a paywall, we can deliver over a thousand key market indicators for iron ore. It's an area of huge growth for us, having this data available through a third party. Should you wish to discuss ways to gain this access, please reach back to me following this presentation. 
And lastly, I'd like to briefly cover off and make mention that we now have a consulting and research division within the business. It's already proving popular given our extensive on the ground knowledge of the Chinese metals market. Our consulting team can look at M&A assessment, market due diligence, trading opportunities, and even procurement tactics. Should any of this trigger interest your side, please reach out to me as we'd be happy to offer an obligation trial to the majority of our data so that you can access the value of it to your organisation. So now I'd like to introduce Hong Mei Lee. She is the head of content for MySteel Global and she will start the presentation for the day. Thank you. All right, uh, thanks everyone for just uh, dialing into this webinar and thanks Ben for introducing me as the next speaker. And today my topic will be China steel market in 2021, which will be this year and until 2025. Just now, HD Ben already introducing our company, um, the general profile, and then I will now to go into details. Just one more thing to share. I joined the company in 2017 October. That was when our company launched the English news website at the same time. And since then, we have been running the English news website together with the Chinese website independently. And uh, English news website actually will be sharing more policy stuff as well as macroeconomic stuff. And uh, under me, actually, I'm running a 12-person editorial team with two people in Japan and 10 people actually are located in Shanghai. So our primary market coverage will be about China, primarily about China's ferrous market regarding steel uh, as well as raw materials. And um, other than that, actually, we do cover the Chinese market uh, from the point of uh, investment in overseas uh, markets such as ASEAN countries. That's about all. And then if you want to know more, do approach us for the company profile and everything. And now, before I start sharing uh, my presentation, just a bit of disclaimer. And just want to highlight that I'm sharing the official data as well as a my steel survey and also some of my personal observations as well. So do treat it as, you know, more about the kind of uh, personal uh, sharing uh, rather than any official uh, statement. Today's agenda will be about four topics. China's January, February performance, uh, more about the macroeconomic, but of course will be the steel production and the foreign trade as well. Another thing will be China's steel consuming sector, which will be talking about China's steel market from the downstream point of view. And then will be the near term market outlook for 2021 as well as uh, until 2025. Both of the latter will be focusing in the context of the macroeconomic as well as the policy environment. Now let's look at what happened in the first two months of this year regarding the foreign trade um, in China's economic performance. So here I don't want to highlight every, uh, I don't want to mention everything, just highlight a few. Year-on-year uh, -year comparison, we're looking at at least 15% year-on-year increase. But the point is that the first quarter of 2020, China was still battling against COVID-19. So many of the base numbers are, were rather low for the first quarter of 2020. That's why, you know, year-on-year -year comparison, many looks rather substantial and outstanding. Do bear the, in, this in mind. Um, you know, for the following slides, it will be the similar case. So I will not be repeating. And for the foreign trade, you know, ASEAN countries as well as European Union countries remain to be China's top two trade partners. And then in total, they are accounting for almost 30% of China's total foreign trade value. And the BRI countries is the same thing. BRI countries actually accounted for about 30%. But do remember, for Belt and Road Initiative countries, they are located in various continents. So this is more to show that China has been paying special attention to this particular group of countries in order to build up economic and political diplomatic relationships. That's the thing I want to highlight for this part. And now let's look at the products. So in the foreign uh, trade market, especially for the exports, machinery, electrical and electronic products exports accounted for about 60% of China's total export value. 
which means that they're dominant export commodities. And that's why China have been paying special attention to this part as well, because China has been rather promoting higher value added finished products exports rather than such as midstream, such as steel. You know, steel is considered as low end and uh, lower value added as well. So from China's point of view, steel exports has never been in the agenda to encourage high export volume of value. Another thing I want to mention is that looking at active parties in the foreign trade market for China, privately owned firms are the ones that have been contributing to the most. If you're looking at both for 2020 as well as 2021, the first two months, such firms are counting for about 50% of the total foreign trade value. So that is why Beijing has been making great efforts to rescuing or sponsoring the privately owned firms during the COVID-19 times. It's simply because they are contributing almost half of the foreign trade. Now let's move to the next one, which will be talking about fixed asset investment. It has been the case, you know, whenever, you know, whether for the country or the global economy in a difficult time, many countries will be spending a lot of money in their economy to sponsoring the development or rescuing the economy. Similar to the last financial crisis, this time the COVID-19 times, China has been spending heavily in the fixed asset investment and infrastructure construction. So if you're looking at both for last year in January as well as the first two months, most of the numbers are in positive zones, year year in comparison, all the growth, all the um, you know growth numbers. And uh, one more thing I want to highlight is that you're looking at the property market. People always find it you know very interesting about China's property market. In general, China's property market has been a leverage for the Beijing to adjusting the economic development space uh, pace. So looking at last year as well, this year in general, it has been positive growth. And the land lease actually will be telling you the sentiment among the developers. So for last year, year in year comparison is 1.1% decline. Whereas for the first two months of this year, it's about 33% increase. It's telling you that the developers are finding you know, greater confidence in, among themselves in order to get new patches of land to develop, to develop new, product, new uh, projects in China. The next one, actually, I will be talking about the core steel consumers. This is about from the downstream sector. I will just pick up um, you know, the major ones. The first one will be the auto market which will be the auto sales production in China. That is a major steel consuming, especially for the flat steel consumption. The next one with excavator. So again, you know, if you're looking at the NEV part, the new energy vehicle part, you know, last year, despite the overall decline in the total auto sales, it managed to achieve about 10% growth year on year. And then if you look at this year, it's almost like tripled. So what it means, it means that China has been, you know, um, definitely putting extra effort to just promote NEV sales. It will be benefiting the auto industry in general, as well as uh, it runs along the line of eco-friendliness because uh, for new energy vehicles in China, there are major two models. One is hybrid, the other is electric cars. And in the future, in the coming years, later I will be mentioning, uh, electric cars actually will be, you know, even more important for China's, you know, auto market. There are specific targets set as well for the next five and 10 years. Excavators, excavators will be a strong and clear card signal of what is happening in China's construction and infrastructure projects. So until actually 2019, the yang yang growth will be more substantial in the export part than the domestic sales part. Whereas for 2020, and as well as for the first two months of this year, the domestic sales grow way faster than the exports, indicating as well that China has been spending heavily, both in the infrastructure, as well as the developers in China have been launching quite a bit of uh, you know, property development projects as well. 
And uh, do remember excavators, there will be uh, small, medium, and large size models. For large size, they are more for mining projects, whereas we are looking at the numbers, the majority actually are more for the small and medium size, which are more for the you know, civil engineering and as well as uh, construction projects. Now let's look at the steel industry itself for 2021. Uh, if you're looking at the steel output, you know, again, 13% year in year um, increment. Uh, but as I mentioned, the first quarter, first quarter of 2020, the number are pretty were pretty small. So that's why the base numbers, you know, contributed to the year in year growth. Um, all the numbers are official numbers. And then one more thing I want to highlight among the all will be about the finished steel export and the imports. Different from the previous years, even for the 2020, you know, both China's steel export and import increased on year for the first two, two months of this year. The, the thing I want to highlight here is that China nowadays has been more looking at the pricing competitiveness between the domestic supplies versus overseas supplies. So it's no longer like kind of clear cut, you know, common sense whether China want to export or import. It's more to do with who is more competitive in pricing. And China, because it's the largest consumer as well as the largest producer of steel, is ready to be, you know, treated as a trading hub to, you know, uh, encourage the free circulation of steel products whenever it makes sense for it to do so. Another thing is iron ore imports, year-on-year -year comparison still grew by about 3%. Uh, but last year it was about 10%. I think last year we do need to remember on the annual basis, the unit price of iron ore it didn't really increase that much on year. So, you know, whenever the prices were reasonable, it makes sense for the Chinese steel mills to stock up some quantity just in case, because after all, China has been heavily relying on the imported iron ore for its steel production. And here will be something or some surveys done by my steel. Here I'm just using rebar because rebar is the most liquid product in the Chinese steel market. And um, also when I say liquid, it's not only about the quantity as well as the pricing terms as well. Rebar is more about spot sales than long-term supply deals. So its movement, its stocks levels will be telling you about what is happening in China steel market. And looking at the right part, the, 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 the orange red part uh, is more about the stocks with the steel mills. And the yellow part actually is more about the commercial, um, you know, commercial warehouses stocks or the trader stocks. So if you're looking at um, the past three years, the highest point will be around the first quarter of last year. And the stocks definitely has been decreasing. And now we are not really back to the pre-COVID-19 period about the level, but we are not really as high as last year. So the inventories will not be, uh, you know, imposing too much pressure on the rebar prices if the market just goes as per normal. And here actually we'll be touching upon the China's steel mills iron ore consumption model. And there will be three lines, uh, you know, the red line will be talking about, about pellets, and then the yellow line will be more talking about the sintered fines, and the blue line will be more about the alarms. You'll notice that the good days or bad days, the sintered fines are still accounting for the majority, definitely above the 30, uh, 70%. The balance of the 30% will be divided between pellets and lumps. And Chinese steel mills, actually, even though the, the trend is not so obvious yet, but you'll notice that slowly and gradually, China has been increasing um, the consumption for the pallets because of the cost effectiveness as well as the productivity compared with the other two products. And this has also to do with Beijing's greater emphasis on the eco-friendliness because for the steel mills, you know, the sintering and the coking are the most polluting parts. So whenever Beijing actually uh, imposing the, the restriction on the steel operations, the sintering and the coking will be the most affected. Whereas the blast furnaces, you know, you can use lumps or pallets or even scrap to make sure that your steel output will be just running as per normal. 
Um, why I'm highlighting the Coke prices as well as the steel mills Coke stocks? The reason is simple, is because that starting last August, the prices have been jumping up all the way until uh, towards the Chinese New Year period. The reason behind this is, of course, a robust demand from the Chinese mills among higher steel output. But at the same time, it has to do with China's supply side reform as well. In China, you know, the coal industry has been going through quite some time of uh, supply side reform. Uh, it's not only about the capacity elimination, it's more about the larger size, more efficient and more advanced coal mining as well. So the supply side reform triggered this, uh, you know, um, for a certain period of time, it will be supply tightness, especially when the Chinese steel mills having a larger appetite for coke. Um, that is why, you know, the prices have been surging all the way. Look at the right part, you know, the pricing index has been surging all the way starting last August and to sometime, you know, during the Chinese New Year. But recently, it decreased quite substantially. Um, Again, you know, two factors. The demand was not really as robust. And then another thing is because the supply actually comes up as well. After the winter, you know, after, you know, you know the many mining operations will be focusing more about the thermal coal than the coking coal supply. Here is about the Beijing rebar versus Tangshan Bellet. Um, both are North China markets, and uh, I'm using this. The red line will be regarding the rebar prices, whereas the yellow line will be regarding the bellet prices. I just want to highlight that you know the bellet as well as rebar having the fundamental support, especially for the production cost. Later on, I will show you the bellet. But for now, if you look at the rebar and bellet, there has to be a reasonable gap because because of the processing fee. If let's say you are a re-roller, you will need at least 300 RMB around that in order to roll the bellet into rebar. So the gap is more to reflect the processing cost as well. And for the time being, you'll notice that the gap actually narrowed, which means that, you know, the rebar price is definitely having the support from the high billet prices. And now let's look at the billet prices versus the import cost, in, uh, input cost. And then I'm using Tangshan as example because Tangshan is the largest steel making uh, city in China. And uh, again, you know, the right part actually will be talking about the billet prices and the yellow part will be talking about the complete cost. You will see that there was a time, you know, during the 2020 and 2021, there was a time the cost actually will be high, were even higher than the prices. So even if you're complaining about the billet prices were higher, which means that the production costs were even higher. So Billet producers are actually uh, were making losses instead of making a profit, unlike you know during the 2018 and 2019 period. So for the time being, Tangshan Billet prices definitely having some support from the high raw material costs and input costs in general. 2021, you know, um, just now we look at the overall the status quo, what is happening, what has you know um, been going through in China's economy and the steel industry, and what will be happening for the rest of this year. China said the target for GDP will be at least 6% growth for 2021, which is rather substantial, you know, um, compared with the 2.3% growth for 2020. And which means that, you know, the infrastructure projects will continuing. Uh, normally, it will be taking about two to five, uh, three to five years, you know, the small scale ones will be finished within three years, where the bigger ones will be taking about five years, such as kind of large size airport, right? So um, the momentum will continue, which will be keep uh, contributing to uh, to the GDP. And at the same time, you know, while China growing the GDP, China trying to grow the GDP from consumption oriented economy rather than investment supported or heavy industry relied, because uh, they do feel that that will not be sustainable in the long run. China actually have been trying to shift its model, economic growth model towards consumption oriented. Um, but the only disruption will be last year because of the COVID-19. So now everything is back on track and China will be, you know, just uh, move the, the economic growth model back onto the original path as well. And uh, starting this year, you know, it definitely will be more conscious of the eco-friendliness. And Beijing will continue with its efforts 
to shift the national energy consumption model uh, from you know from more coal to less coal, uh, and also greater emphasis on cleaner energy sources such as LNG, wind, solar, hydro, and nuclear powers. And just now I mentioned the NEVs, right? So uh, for the new energy vehicles, especially for electric cars. The subsidies are supposed to be ending uh, by the end of last year, but because of the COVID-19, so the subsidies actually will be gradually cutting to zero until 2022. And the subsidies will be, you know, more for the NEV vehicles, um, not so much about the common models. And by 2025, China trying to increase the NEV uh, volume, you know, sales in volume uh, to 20% of the total auto sales. Another thing is that in the years to come, as at least for this year, machinery, electrical, and electronic products will be the core for the export value contribution. And you know, privately owned enterprises as well as ASEAN countries, EU, BRI countries will be China's major and key trade partners. And the property market for this year will be remaining as the leverage. China will be using this to adjust the growth. Whenever the growth is behind schedule or behind the progress, China may be loosening the control, especially in the in the second or third tier, or even you know uh, other than the top tier cities, just to gen, um, just to injecting some you know um, revival force into the economy. What will be happening by 2025? Uh, investment, as I mentioned, after three to five years, you know, many ongoing infrastructure uh, projects will come to an end. And then, you know, the really China's economy will really be back onto the track of less polluting, higher value added. And cleaner energy as well. I list out all the targets for both for 2025 as well as 2030. So in January, it means less coal. So for the time being, we uh, the coal consumption uh, in the energy will be about 58%, uh, but the target will be, you know, drop the proportion to below 50. And then by 30, 2030, the portion should be below, you know, 40%. The, the, the gap will be filled up by the cleaner sources. And then another thing I think if you are interested in the derivatives market or commodities market, China is opening up its a financial market, um, especially about the derivatives market to the overseas investors. And so far, we have already seen several products such as oil, iron ore and palm oil. I believe more will be adding into this basket just to make sure that investors, overseas investors will be able to participate in the, tra participate in the trading as well. And in the longer term, uh, for the steel industry, because they were trying to reach the uh, carbon climax by 2025 instead of 2030 for the general rule. Um, that's why you know China need to be gradually replacing blast furnaces with EF. I talked to one of the industrial sources the other day. He mentioned that so long as you know um, blast furnaces are used as a major contribution in China steel production, you won't be able to do too much with a carbon emission because, you know, blast furnaces will definitely use um, use coke, whether you like it or not. So there, that will be the bottleneck you can't really come across, you can't really, you know, break. Um, the best solution will be more scrap um, consumption as well as more EAFs in your steel industry. And by 2025, China also talking about still making raw material self-sufficiency by 45%. And do remember, this is not only about iron ore, this is about scrap as well. So that's a rather strong signal that for the next five years, China will be nurturing its own um, scrap generation industry as well. Because looking at the size itself, you know, the US or Japan will not be able to fill up the gap or make sure, guarantee, you know, a sustainable supply. Um, China has to rely on itself and the reservoir will be big enough for China to generate the scrap itself. Another thing I want to mention is that China steel mills will try to relocate their capacities to the overseas countries. ASEAN countries definitely will be one of the destinations the steel mills have been looking at and the study to see the feasibility and also the cost effectiveness. Um, um, among the ASEAN countries, Indonesia definitely is a hot spot. I think many steel mills already established their prices, presence at this particular ASEAN country. 
Um, that's about all from my sharing. And here is just a, a screenshot of website to show you, you know, it's rather clear cut and simple, and then you can just click and then um, a, having access to our data or to our prices or to our stories, news coverage. And uh, if you want to have a glimpse of what we cover, also feel free to uh, follow us on LinkedIn and Twitter. We do share the hot topics, you know, uh, to the public. So uh, do follow us. Um, on the right side will be my contact details. If you want to know more, uh, do approach me and then I will be willing to share, you know, uh, market information with you. And uh, I also would like to listen to your sharing as well. And now allow me actually to introduce the next speaker, name is Chiao Yuanzhi. Yuanzhi is the Senior Manager of Dalian Commodities Exchange Singapore office. And uh, Yuanzhi actually will be discussing about the hedging tools in the forex market. Uh, Yuanzhi, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Hello everyone, this is Josh Chiao from Dalian Commodities Exchange Singapore office. First, uh, I'd like to say many thanks to my steel global and Inuit for the opportunity to share with you about DCE and our iron ore futures. In today's presentation, I'll first give an overview of DCE's iron ore futures products and then discuss how traders and, uh, can benefit from iron ore futures as well as DCE's future plans. Starting Commodity Exchange was founded in 1993. It is now one of the four commodity exchanges in China approved by the State Council and regulated by China Securities Regulatory Commission, also CSRC. Since the establishment, DCE has been experiencing, uh, experiencing really fast growth, especially in the recent years. So now we have 21 futures products seven options and one OTC market. And DCE has really uh, quickly became the top three agriculture futures exchange. And also now we have the largest plastic futures market in the world. Moreover, by trading volume, DCE is the largest risk management center for iron ore, cooking coal, and coke. <clears throat> in 2018, Iron ore became our first internationalized futures, and it is also the second internationalized product from China. Also, in that same year, we set up our Singapore office. So now DCE has two internationalized futures, iron ore and palm oil in futures. All right, uh, some information on iron ore contract. Uh, the contracts underlying Iron ore is, uh, represents uh, 62% and uh, with the delivery points in the northern port of China. For example, Shandong province, Tianjin, and Dalian. Uh, the contract size is 100 metric tons per contract and DCE offers monthly contract up to a year. So uh, that means a uh, trader can trade all the uh, contracts, uh, the next 12 month contract up, uh, up to April 2022. And also, uh, iron ore is an internationalized contract, so traders can all over the world can trade directly to Dalian. The contract uh, remains the same uh, as we internationalized, so it's uh, still RMB denominated. Uh, we does uh, take US dollar as collateral. And the minimum margin for the iron ore futures is 8%. And the last point, uh, this is iron ore is all uh, electronic on screen trading. And uh, at the end expiration of the contract is physically settled. Also during the, con uh, during the uh, before the expiration, traders can choose to exchange their positions for physicals. Uh, this shows the volume and open interest in the recent years. Uh, I'd say that the iron ore futures has already passed the rapid growth period. Now the volume in recent years fluctuates depending on the market conditions. And as you can see, last year 
we uh, the disease iron ore futures achieved uh, average daily trading volume close to 1.2 million contracts. So that converts to an average of 120 million tons traded every day. And open interest average about 92 million tons daily. Uh, some, as some of the audience may be aware of, that the, in the recent month, uh, January and February this year, uh, our volume did drop due to some measurements taken by the exchange. But still, the overall market is uh, very active and liquid. Also, it's uh, functioning very well. This chart shows the price actions in the past year. Uh, I think everyone is impressed by the big rally last year, and also uh, iron ore is one of the best performing commodity uh, in commodity world. It does not dip a lot uh, like the others do. So uh, as DCS uh, iron ore futures has very really high correlation with the stock, uh, sorry, the spot market price, also the SJX flats contract. Uh, that makes our futures a really e effective hedging tool. So the traders can use this uh, contract to hedge their risk, uh, both in uh, in the short position and long position. Moreover, as our iron futures is quite active, so the price ticks every second. It does provide a really good live market reference and potential for the traders to find trading opportunities. As I mentioned previously, DCS iron ore is physically settled. So the, the uh, delivery mechanism is really important to the traders as it, as it de determines what the price represents and uh, what uh, actual products the traders are trading. Uh, DCE has a brand de delivery mechanism for the uh, for the delivery process, so only the specified brands can be delivered to the exchange. Currently, there are 18 different brands included, and when doing the final settlement, we do have a, a premium and discount from each brand, and that uh, amount is then plus the is then. Uh, added to the quality premium and discount uh, so that the seller get the actual final settlement price of the products they deliver. Uh, although the uh, futures is physically settled, the actual delivery is only a tiny fraction of the total trading volume. So most open interests are liquidated before the expiration of the contract. Next, let's move on to internationalization. Uh, DC internationalized iron ore futures in 2018, and now there are basically three ways for international clients to access the Dalian iron ore futures. Uh, first way on the left, uh, we call it the direct account opening way. So the overseas clients will they need to be in contact with the uh, Chinese futures company members one of our members, and then they will set up a uh, set up a uh, account together. Because this method requires uh, some more complicated documentation and also uh, international wire transfers and an account opened by the clients, not many in international institutions choose to do it this way. Only uh, about 20% of the overseas account. So uh, most. People uh, over overseas clients choose to uh, open account with the carrying brokerage way. So they choose one of our overseas brokers or overseas intermediaries who has an entrustment agreement with one of our futures company members domestically. And those overseas brokers can be your uh, existing uh, broker or an investment bank you are using. So now, there are about 60 overseas intermediaries uh, of DCE, and they are from nine countries and regions. There are currently 11 in Singapore. Uh, those include some investment banks, um, brokerage firms, 
and also some local futures company. Besides these two ways, uh, recently DC announced the, the rules on overseas special participants. So under the special participant way, the overseas clients can uh, access the exchange through DMA. So the, their, their trading is more direct, but the clearing is still done by one of our members in, in China. Oh, so that's uh, basically how international clients can trade DCE. Uh, since the internationalization, we do see uh, tremendous growth from international clients, and we're still getting more and more interest from big physical players and big financial institutions. Uh, here are some stats. So by end of February this year, uh, we have 367 overseas accounts open from 24 countries and regions. And re in the recent month, the overseas trading volume and open interest is quite steady at 5% and 4% respectively from uh, of the overall iron ore market. So that's to uh, re represent a, a, about uh, four to five a million metric tons traded from overseas. Uh, it's quite a lot. Okay, last part of my presentation, I'll share some uh, future plans from DC. And first, on the iron futures. Uh, first, we will enhance our delivery mechanism. Uh, DC will continuously monitor and evaluate the deliverable specs. Uh, we may include or exclude some brands and we'll adjust the premium and discounts on the quality and on each brand based on the market conditions so that we, uh, we are sure that our delivery uh, contract, our rules and regulations are in the, in the market, uh, meet the market needs. Also, we'll add more delivery points, especially for the overseas clients, we'll add more funded delivery ports. Uh, the second is uh, we will improve the non-liquid contracts. Uh, some of you might be aware that in DCE's IMR futures, the active contracts are shifting among January, May, and the September month. So we know that it is not uh, uh, it is not really beneficial or effective for the physical players to hatch or for for the, the trading firms to, to to find opportunities. So that's why we're trying to improve the non-liquid contract liquidity. Uh, we've already implemented a lower trading fees on those contracts and also uh, we have market maker and warehouse receipt provider to make sure uh, the, de the delivery process went through smooth, smoothly. Uh, last part is we, we, or we are looking, looking into launch alternative products, for example, uh, a higher grade premium contracts, uh, cash settled, also calendar spread, and also trade at settlement. So those are the vari variations from the original DC 62% iron futures. And for to the exchange uh, as an in an exchange level, DC has been trying to achieve um, steady growth, and we try to better serve serve the market. Uh, this is done by through innovation and internationalization. On the new product side, uh, in the past year we have launched uh, the LPG and uh, Live Box futures. And we're looking to launch uh, steel scrap and also freight or cargo futures. Those are really highly correlated with the iron ore industry. And also we're looking to have more agricultural products launched. Second is uh, internationalization. Uh, we strive to make more products to be available uh, to the international clients and we try to provide international clients with easier access uh, to our market. Uh, that's what we've been trying to do. 
and also uh, Qtree and R Qtree that's uh, worth mentioning. Um, so the commodity exchanges in China are finalizing the rules on the Qtree and R Qtree so that those eligible institutions can access a wider range of commodity products in China. Uh, and the last point I want to say is <clears throat> uh, DC try to better serve the market. Uh, currently, there are things or well, the, the major projects we are working on is first uh, try to accept more types of assets as collateral. That is, includes uh, other currencies, uh, more currencies other than US dollar, and perhaps uh, some sovereign bonds as collateral. Uh, also, uh, DC is developing our uh, own marketing system called Rulo. We wish, uh, we hope this new marketing system can reduce the uh, the marketing cost of the clients significantly. And also, uh, we are always in the process to uh, serve our overseas market to uh, get more comments and su suggestions from our overseas clients and friends. So everyone, please contact me on any questions or comments you have on DCE and do go to our website, follow our uh, WeChat and LinkedIn for the latest updates. Thank you for listening. Good afternoon once again, and thank you those who have just joined us. Welcome to the webinar brought to you by Anwit and my still in association with Tallinn Community Exchange. I'm Crystal Yost, the directors from Anwit, and I'm joined today by four industry experts who is going to discuss about the opportunity and challenges within the steel sectors and also the technologies on how to uh, uh, role that is important to it. Again, that you have the opportunity to submit your text questions by tapping your questions in the control panels on your right, and uh, we we'll address them right after this discussion panels. So, if we are running out of time, you can rest assured that we will uh, definitely give you the answer back uh, by sending your emails. So, do note that at the bottom right, you also see some resources for your download as well. Uh, so, uh, without further ado, uh, I think most of our panelists have turned on their cameras. So, could I have the rest of the panelists to turn off your camera and unmute your microphone, please? Set. Everybody's on. Let's see. Thank you. Thanks. So joining me today is uh, Lee Homei, head of English editorial from My Steel Global, and we have uh, Josh Chell, a senior manager from Talin Commission Exchange, and we have uh, Virgil Chai, product development manager from Anuit based in Singapore, and we also have Sean Sia, English editor in charge of Co and Cook in my steel global. So without further ado, uh, we're going to start our discussion panel today. Uh, today we have really looking at the list of people. We have a diverse audience within the furious industry. So also participants from the business risk side of the business that I see. So who are tasked to look for commodities trading risk management systems like we call it in short CTRM um, to effectively manage their trading and risk management activities. Uh, with this requirement in mind, I would like to start today's uh, discussion probably uh, giving the question to Virgil uh, from Anuit. Virgil, are you there? Yes, thank yeah? you. I can hear you, thank you. So Virgil, uh, I have got two questions, but I'll start with the first one first. Uh, what do you think are the key attributions of a good solutions for commodities trading business? Hmm. Okay, thank you for the questions, uh, Crystal. Let me see. And what is considered a good solution? Before I answer the question, I would like to highlight that my answer today will not be very specific to the ferrous metal industry because a good solution shall never be meant for just one industry. As someone who spent a large portion of his career growing together with a commodity trading house, I have witnessed evolution of business requirements from a small and a humble local business all the way to a multinational trading house. This experience tells me that this is a highly dynamic era of changes. Trading houses prefer to grab every opportunity whenever they can, regardless of the commodity categories or the business workflows. 
when the solution, either building house or purchase externally, is unable to respond to the new commodity type or the new business process, major disruptions can be expected. More often than not, under such circumstances, the person in charge of the solution will usually say, we certainly can develop an enhancement for you. And I'm sure some of you have heard this phrase a number of times. However, it is usually too late by the time the enhancement is delivered, especially when the original system is too stiff to upgrade in the first place. Therefore, I firmly believe that a good solution shall be genetically ready to manage trading portfolios across multiple asset classes, capture business data, process those data into usable and easily understandable information in a highly intuitive and most importantly, flexible manner. Furthermore, if you think about the ultimate value adding output of a solution, the first thing that usually comes to mind is report. Hence, a good solution shall naturally come with accurate, highly custom, and readily accessible reports. The importance of accuracy speaks for itself, right? And highly custom is inevitable because reporting itself can be an incredibly organizational specific matter. And in the year of 2021, readily accessible probably means that the report shall be available at one's fingertip, preferably with some visual aids. Lastly, I want to point out that a solution sometimes does not consist of only one system. The ease of integration among these systems can be just as important as the strengths of the core system. Let's take the steel trading for example. People usually need to manage their inventory at the individual warehouse lot level, or individual batch level, or individual uh, uh, member level at some kind of with some kind of tagging number there. So if the downstream finance and accounting system requires their financial data also to be prepared at this level too, the commodity trading management system being the core of the entire solution had better be up to the challenge. So I think that marks the end of my, uh, my answer to the first question. Thanks so much. I think it will be very useful for you know the the people that is here who's taking care of the searching for CTRM systems as well. So let me um, ask you the second questions will be um, you know what are some of the common misunderstanding and challenges of CTRM implementations? Maybe uh, possible solutions to offer as well. So uh, back to you again, Virgil. Hi. Uh, misunderstanding challenges and uh, possible approaches to cope with the, 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 the problems above, right? Mm, yeah, that's... Mm -hmm. Okay, well, first of all, I think a very, very common misunderstanding is that a CTR will always reduce the workload of the users. Right? And uh, it might be politically right to, to make that statement. And, Although this is true to a certain extent, and we absolutely wish that for all the users, this might not always be the case. Undoubtedly, one of the business purposes of a CTRM is to improve the efficiency of business, work, of business processes. But there is another equally important, if not more important goal, and that is improving the integrity of the business process. So you might be wondering, what am I talking about? What is the integrity of business process? So a simple way to understand the word integrity over here is by thinking about how much time people have been investing in reconciliating the numbers from different departments. Sometimes it is not even possible to achieve complete reconciliation manually. It is just painful to think about the process if you have been through that. And a CTRM project removes that pain so that the number across different departments are always tallying with each other because they come from the same resource. They come from the very same source, ultimately speaking. And this should be considered a successful project as long as a project can do that. And even though sometimes the workload for some users in some department have increased marginally to achieve that level of integrity, I think that is the expense that is worth paying. Therefore, I believe that 
to say that a CTRM project or CTRM implementation project is always there to reduce the workload of the user might not always be the case, and that's a, it's a common misunderstanding. Yeah. And after all, no matter how intuitive a CTRM system is, Microsoft itself is and will continue to be in many people's favor. Hence, reluctance is kind of expected from the regular users. And secondly, I've seen that many people are already in celebration mode right after the announcement of Go Live of a CTRM implementation project. Unfortunately, the hard truth is, no matter how thorough the user acceptance testing process is, there are always missed spots. And those spots, those spots are probably the toughest spots. And they tend to surface in the first three, one to three months since the go live. Therefore, I think the users and the management of the trading house should be cautiously optimistic and adjust their expectation reasonably during that period in the first one to three months. And furthermore, the project team, the project implementation team members should stay alert, responsive, and responsible during that period. Thanks, Roger, because just, so sorry to just cut you short a little, okay. because uh, thank you so much for giving us a few points, because we have a few questions to go with. Okay. You know, thank you so much. I think that's very valuable feedback for our team. I, my apologies, uh, because we are just looking about the time a little. So yeah. could I ask Virgil if um, delegates would like to find more information, maybe we can send an email over to them if they like to. Yeah, and absolutely. we can direct more questions to you after. Yeah. Sure, no yeah. problem. I would love to do thank that. you. Thank you so much, Virgil. My, my apologies. Thanks. Um, I think I've got the next question uh, for George. Um, George, as the fewest market grows in maturity, it becomes more liquid and hedging conscious as well. So um, could I ask what are the opportunity and challenges to the existing furious product diversities and exchanges? Would you give us a heads up on that? Yeah, yes, sure. Uh, thanks, Crystal. Uh, I do think that opportunities and challenges, they come together. Uh, I'll just list two examples. First, uh, as we internationalize the contracts where we do see uh, more uh, interest from overseas clients that's a big opportunity for us uh, that can, could potentially bring a lot of overseas volume and also attract those big names in the market huge opportunity however as you may know that the chinese market has quite a unique settings compared to the rest of the world uh, in terms of the trading and also the regulations so uh, we it's quite challenging for us to uh, better serve the international market and also to find the common ground between China and the rest of the world. However, I think this can be solved by the markets, our clients and also our uh, overseas brokers working together. And uh, another point I want to point out is that now uh, we are in a fast changing world and the iron market changes fast as well. So. Um, when the market has uncertainties, traders are more willing to trade and hedge their positions. That's opportunities for us. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, as the market changes really fast, we need to make sure that the contracts are up to date. For example, our uh, contract specs on the different brands, the premium and discounts. And uh, we need to make sure that those are up to date that rep represent the current market. And also in the market surveillance side, we don't want to see over speculation in the in the trading. So it's kind of to find the balance between the liquidity and the overall market. Those are uh, another challenge that I can think of. Uh, thank you, Crystal. Yeah, thanks, George. This uh, will be very useful information for for the delegates. So, uh, Sean, a question for my steel Clover. I know that China has just released the 14 5 year plan and can you share with us what changes will be brought to China and also the world steel industry with China's greater focus on uh, the eco-friendliness and carbon emissions in mind? Uh, yeah, thank you, Crystal. Um, I think the 14 5 year plan has mentioned steel for several times and uh, among them there was a very clear target for the steel industry that is um, by 2025 
the last year of the plan, um, China will complete the ultra-low emission upgrading for another 530 million tons per year of steel capacity. I remember as of last year, um, over 600 million tons per year has been done. So plus them, um, by 2025, over 80% of the country's steel capacity is scheduled to achieve the ultra-low emission standard. And um, following the plan, some industrial policy advisors are now viewing the approaches to pick the industry's carbon emission by 2025 as well. Um, there was, that was five years ahead of the national plan in 2030. So I think it's quite urgent for the country's steelmakers to work on detailed plans and it is almost predictable that um, more electric arc furnaces will be commissioned, as Homi mentioned in her PPT, and uh, hydrogen will be used to replace coke and coking coal in steel making. And um, even more directly, some um, um, China's steel output will be controlled, and that is what some uh, ministries in the country are doing and will, be keep, will keep working on in, for the rest of this year. Um, of, of course, I think it will add cost to China's steel mills temporarily, but survival for the fittest. So this is now what some industrial regulators are promoting. Thank you. Thanks, Sean. So um, you know, really, uh, we what why we you know a little bit cutting short a little bit of panel discussion because we have overwhelming of questions coming in. I'm seeing them. So thank you, panelists. Uh, so let let me go straight to the floor and pull out some questions that that we have from delegates. Uh, and uh, I think this question is uh, tilted to my steel global. How do you think the second half demand and supply for steel pan out in China? Maybe Hong Mei, you can pick this one up. Uh, yes, sure. Uh, yes, uh, second half. We we are just uh, almost past the first quarter. With all the uncertainties in the global economy, um, I think more, not so much about the China, I think China's economic development already back to the normal track. But if you look at the second half, you know, I was really, you know, trying to remember everything from the past comments from the other organization, like World Steel Association, I think sometime earlier on mentioned that China's debunked will be flat on year. Personally, we, we had a kind of a bit of discussion saying that how, how that is possible, you know, chi this is China, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, personally, I do feel that you have to look at different sectors, like uh, um, there is definitely a momentum from last year regarding the infrastructure construction. So the demand for the construction material real for the second half most probably will stay strong. And then if you're looking at the auto sector, as I mentioned in the presentation, right, um, the auto sales, you know, you, you try to, even if you try to keep at a certain level, but China trying to promote the um, electric car sales. So which means that that will be generating some uh, steel demand for that particular sector as well. Um, new energy vehicles in general too. Um, but then if you're looking at another thing like property market, right, property market is always a leverage. It could be good, it could be bad, it depending on really whether you can achieve the 6% GDP uh, growth at least for this year. So a uh, property market will be having a bit of uncertainties, but in general, I would say I put it neutral or slightly positive. Shipbuilding, shipbuilding, um, Shipbuilding, I, I'm not really so optimistic because not so much about the shipbuilding industry is not doing well. It is to some extent because of the eco-friendliness. A lot of vessels are changing from you know the, the normal fuel into the LNG fueled vessels. But because that China is not really having the advanced technology or it's not really competitive in such ship building. That's why for the shipbuilding industry, it will be challenging. So if you're looking at all in general, uh, I still remember a couple of months ago when I having a discussion with the uh, World Studio Association, my personal view is that uh, in general for this year, I think the demand will at least grow a kind of a single digit. Uh, it's very hard to put specific numbers because um, Whenever you're talking about China steel market, right, it's never ever only about domestic because China, as I mentioned in my presentation, um, you know, uh, machinery, electric and electronic, uh, electrical and electronic products are exported. So it very much depending on how how well it will be doing in the export sector. If let's say this particular majority product is doing well, which contributing to 60% of China's export value, then you know the demand from that sector will be rather substantial as well. 
it's just a few highlights. Hope that answer the question. Yeah. Thank you. I think it, it will be very helpful the delegates who asked this. So the next questions I have here is for uh, DCE. Um, George, I think over to you. Is there any um, other viewers products that DCE is reviewing to enrich, sorry, the basket or derivatives, or are there other efforts to uh, internationalize the iron ore contracts? So I think this is somebody who's keen on the iron ore questions. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Yeah. Um, okay. The next uh, product that we are looking at is uh, steel scrap, uh, steel scrap futures. And I think it may be launched in the next year or so, in the coming next year or so. Also, this is looking for some uh, cash settlement possibilities on the higher grade, uh, higher grade iron ore. For example, like 65% uh, premium uh, trading on the price difference between between the 65 and 62. Mm, also, uh, iron ore options has already launched domestically. Uh, DC is looking for uh, right time to internationalize iron ore options. Yeah, that's our the pipeline of uh, iron ore uh, contracts. Products. That's it. Thank you. Thanks, Josh. Um, the next questions. Uh, it's from, from sorry, gentleman from India. Um, sorry, uh, my still. Uh, do you see any potential for hydrogen direct reductions in China? Is there any R&D going on now? I'm not too sure if Hong Mei can pick it up. Uh, I think um, just now Sean mentioned a little bit. Sean, do you want to add on a little bit before you know I, I can uh, elaborate on, on based on what you share? So you, you mean the hydrogen sure. use in steel making? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, I noticed we, we know I noticed recently some steel makers are beginning to. Um, to to de develop these techniques in their steel making, but I don't see any material process in it. So I think it's a little bit difficult to predict when the most of the country most of the country's steel makers will adopt these techniques. But um, um, this is a trend, I think. Yeah. Uh from my point, actually, um, you know, totally agree with Sean. Definitely, the road has uh, road. Uh, you know, the, the the plan has rolled out. Uh, definitely, R and D um, is underway, especially for the top tier steel mills. You know, you can check up with Gao. Probably, they are already working on it. Some of the other steel mills are also working on the possibility. But when whenever you're looking at hydrogen, not only about China, looking at the European market, the same thing. Cost, cost is one of the things you have to look at. Definitely, uh, and you know, uh, I, I don't know how much you guys closely following the Chinese steel market. Many years ago, you know, uh, Bao Wu developed back then. It was still Bao Steel. Uh, Bao Steel actually um, erected two uh, two blast two furnaces. Um, I think using the Corex cat, uh, technology, if I'm correct, if if I remember it correctly. But at the end of the day, it's not about the technology. It's more about the cost. So given that, you know, China have been producing a lot of commercial grade, um, low value added products, construction steel, all those not really advanced, you know, products, um, which means that you're still margin, you know, um, at good days, a, a, in good days, it will be super handsome. At bad days, it's resisting. And then the cost, you have to be conscious. So hydrogen, even in the European markets, just go into this kind of uh, uh, production process, right? So I think for China, it's still a long way to go. And also, uh, as, uh, as, Strong, uh, as Strong mentioned just now, China trying to um, realize this carbon uh, climax in the steel industry by 2025 which means that steel industry still have another like five years to go. Um, so normally for R&D, hydrogen is already a te te technology in the industry. It's more about the cost effectiveness. So I believe like, you know, definitely R&D underway, um, but in the production process, I think it will be taking longer than the European market. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. I think we pick up probably the last questions before we end um, from, hold on one second. Uh, I think it's, it's my still again. Do you think that Tanshan production cuts will last until December 2021? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I definitely feel so. I think Sean definitely can add on a little bit about the uh, the coking part, but from my part, the steel part, do remember Tanshan is the largest steel making city 
and do remember Tangshan is so near to Beijing. Everyone is watching it. And then, uh, but of course, you know, a couple of, uh, uh, I think in, in, in February or early March, there is a kind of ambush inspection, uh, noticing that some steel mills are not really behaving themselves. And uh, that triggered this kind of a crackdown, serious crackdown uh, by, by Beijing. And then make sure that everyone behave, right? So the government even leased the company name saying that, you know, company A, you are supposed to do this, company B, you are supposed to do that, right? To, to uh, basically fill up whatever loophole so Tangshan, the production restriction, uh, I would say that uh, there will be little doubt that this kind of a curbing efforts will be lasting throughout the year. Um, but then there is a kind of a degree difference, right? It's 30% or 50%. And then other than those named companies, what about the other? This, right, so there may be some slight uh, variation, but I would say that there would be really minimum. Yeah, uh, Sean, so from your side about the coking, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Mm. yeah, we actually from the raw materials, and I we we recently ob observed a uh, little transport uh, trading at some ports in Tangshan, or the significant reduction of outside iron trading comparing to those in East China's ports. But for the coke, for the coke power, coke, I think it's the most, most serious impact on this industry because coke is kind of China's domestic, domestically produced and uh, consumed. So, so the Changshan's uh, air pollution measures will impact these uh, products very much than, than iron ore. I think comparing with uh, comparing with uh, coke, I don't know fundamentally is kind of globally correlated. So, so the, the pressure from China can be partially cushioned by rising demand in other countries, including um, South and Southeast Asia's countries or regions. Thank you. Thanks so much, Sean. Because uh, it's you know we are up to time, so I really want to thank all speakers and panelists. And apologize to you know to cut the panel's discussion a little bit short. Uh, for all the guests who joined us, thank you for your time today. And I hope you find the presentations and the discussions very useful. Uh, as we promised, uh, any questions that not answered during the panel or discussion, nor or the Q and A session, sorry to say, uh, we will definitely get back to you via email. And uh, you know, thank you so much, and we look forward to seeing all of you again uh, in the next event that we have. And have a great week ahead and uh, stay safe then. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Goodbye. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.